Okay, good morning. Uh, we are going to talk about the basics of uh, uh, kind of introduction to what we uh, need to basically know uh, about computers before we can actually thinking thinking of how to program. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. So um, let's start again. We are going to talk about um, when you speak, I cannot concentrate. My apologies. If you want to talk, speak outside. Thank you. Okay? One more time. Okay. Let's begin. I want to start uh, by uh, uh, talking about what actually a computer is and how does it deal with stuff. And then after that, we're going to uh, quickly dive into um, uh, the tool that we use for programming. And after that, we're going to see what we're going to do. Okay? And uh, we'll go by your feedback, which means uh, the quicker you learn, the faster I go. The slower, the, I can't say slower, the, the, the more uh, uh, questions I get from the class, I'm going to go slower. So let's put it that way. Okay, so it's on your feedback that we are going to actually work on things. So what is a computer? Uh, Computers are known to be smart things that we deal with. I talked about computers. I, I told you that computers are, um, are nothing but some dumb uh, things that do stuff quickly, and that's why we use them. So um, essentially, working with a computer um, is difficult. Um, programming a computer is very difficult. But because it does the task we try to teach it quickly, it's worth it. That's the only reason. You're going to sit, work for hours and hours and hours, do something, and it's going to perform something for you uh, hundreds of times very quick, and that, that makes it worth it. Now, um, uh, the, we try to make this uh, process and task of programming efficient every day. So that's why all the different languages are there. Each one of them are tackling certain things so you can narrate your story in a computer language better. Um, we used to have uh, old languages that nobody, I think, ever programs and it had now it used to be called COBOL and PL1 and things like very, very old languages. These languages where one of them was business driven, the other one was uh, uh, more work uh, to work with mathematics and uh, other ones were uh, recursive so you could actually do parsing and translation with it. Right? So, so um, um, it made uh, the um, um, the process of programming easier. So we are at the stage now we have tools that we actually use to make to make programs it's going to be much easier for us to do it. And we'll, we'll go through it. Um, what is a computer? Computer is essentially uh, the whole essence of a computer comes from a um, uh, few major units that you need to understand what they are. Um, the units I'm talking about is the very first thing that, that you, when, when you talk about a computer, you say the computer is, uh, you call it a CPU. So we say the CPU of my computer is like this, and usually we refer to the body of your computer with CPU. CPU is not a body of the computer. CPU is the central processing unit, is a chip this big installed on a board called motherboard on your computer and it does all the thinking okay so but 
uh, a computer is essentially is built like a tree. Now I'm going to tell you it's built like a tree. You're going to say what the heck you're talking about. Uh, when you look at a tree, a tree is made up of very small trees attached to it, right? So if you essentially break one branch and make it straight, that becomes a tree of itself. Then you take another branch of that one and look at it, that's another tree. So they have a small concept of input-output processing, and they put them together, and it created this huge, ginormous thinking machine, okay? So essentially, every single computer comes, every single process of the computer happens with these processes. First, you have an input. From the input, you pass the information from outside, from you and I, users, to the input. Input passes those information to what we call CPU, central processing unit. Central processing unit gets all those stuff that uh, you pass to the uh, to it. Gets all the stuff that you pass to it, and dumps it in a place to process. It it calls it memory. And then after that, so essentially all the data you entered from the CPU goes to memory to be kept so it can process it. Then it goes through it over and over. So it's a back and forth of data going to memory and coming out while the CPU is doing its work. And after the CPU comes up with a conclusion, um, uh, then it simply passes the data out to uh, what we call essentially output. So that's the process that happens inside a little chip in your computer. Put five billions of those things together and that you're gonna have a computer, okay? Uh, it looks like, the thing, so essentially the, the, the left one over here is your monitor, the right one over here is your keyboard. You enter the information, it goes to the very bad analogy. Goes to CPU, CPU passes it to the memory, memory does the uh, well, back and forth, the information goes, so the CPU processes that and finds out one, what the result is, and it comes out. This memory can be many things, okay? Um, anything you can store the data on is that memory. So, what are the types of memory? Give me one example of memory, something that you can store something on. An SDD? Wow, okay, you went to solid state hard drive. You went, <laughs> okay, so a hard drive, okay. Uh, what else? Come up with something. Portable device. A portable device. A USB drive. External hardware. So we all go, but inside the computer, what we have is? Random access memory. It's random access memory. What we call it RAM. What, why they call it random access? Not just randomly we put garbage in it. When you say random access memory, essentially it means you can either read or write from it. That's why they call it random. We have read only memory. Read only memory is uh, what gives your computer its personality. When you turn on your computer and the computer starts saying, who am I, where am I? It tries to look to what it is, goes to the very first thing that it has in hand. Probably it's the hard drive. Oh, there you go, there's a hard drive. Let me see who I am. Then it starts receiving information from hard drive. That information could be Windows, could be Mac iOS, could be Linux. So it receives its identity from the hard drive and boots up. And that booting up brings up the operating system. Now, operating system, this read-only memory only reads that operating system into the computer. But the operating system now comes over and takes charge, which means now everything goes under the supervision of operating system. Linux, Mac OS, Windows, right? So what happens over here is that any process, any program you are running, you are actually putting it on your hard drive on, and you tell to the operating system, execute that. 
Operating system does this. Again, it's not a keyboard anymore. Operating, operating system receives the program from the hard drives, gives it to the CPU, CPU puts it in a, and puts it properly in the memory, tells to the CPU to execute it, CPU execute it. The answer is the game that you're shooting people in. The answer is the driving simulation. The answer is turning on your thermostat. The answer is changing the channel on your TV. So all these things happen inside through an operating system, okay? And we all bow to the operating system. Operating system is the one that supervises to see we are not going off boundary. So it gives us a piece of memory and tells you, this is the place your program is supposed to be in. You write your program properly and you don't go out of that piece of memory, you're fine. As soon as you put, set your foot outside of that thing, boom, it crashes your program and stops and says, you went out of your memory. You cannot do that. Why? Because we have so many programs running at the same time in our program. This used to be a CPU when I was a, a computer when I was a child. We had one CPU and that one CPU did the stuff and every program had to, had to wait for another program to run. So essentially the operating system, when it actually executed a program, it would bring in the program and it would set aside. So no operating system, now the program runs. When the program ended, it went away, the operating system came back. So it was very, very uh, uh, primitive. Now you have four CPUs on your computer. Each CPU has four cores and each cores can execute four threads. So you have 64 CPUs. My cell phone has eight CPUs. So it's like the cell phone that I have is more powerful than a supercomputer that CIA had 30 years ago. So I'm telling you, it is, things are getting very complicated. That's why I stop right at that moment. I'm not gonna go more than this. So it's one of the things that you say, first Earth got cold, then dinosaurs came, they ate too much, they died, and now we are programming. It's like that. I'm not going into the details of how the things happen, right? So I'm just going to stop right here and tell you that this is the process that we are going to do, which essentially we're going to learn to write a program that receives information, stores the information somewhere, processes the information, and gives us the result. And we're going to do it in a most primitive way. And then after that, we're going to learn to make it more sophisticated as we are going. So you start with uh, um, a loop that, uh, a circle that runs something over and over five times and prints one to five. And by end of semester three, you learn how to create five processes that work at the same time and parallel, par in a parallel way computes some sophisticated data and handshakes with each other and oh yeah, things that we don't understand what they are now. So that was first Earth got cold and then all started. So what are we doing? We are learning a language called C. Uh, C language uh, uh, was created in Bell Labs. Bell, you know, the one that you have cell phones with. It was, and it used to be called B, okay? So it was the language B, okay? Then they made it more sophisticated and it went very nice and beautiful. So they said, what do we call it? Oh, that was called B, so let's call this one C. So the name of the language came from there. And the language was very good. Most of the operating systems that you see, they have some C in it. Like Linux operating system is written, mostly written in C. Um, it is a middle level language, which means, I'll explain exactly what high level and low level means, but it's a middle level language. It means you can play with it any way you want. And then after C couldn't handle the things anymore and be, things became too complicated, they added another feature that simulates the real world inside your program. If, so you build your stuff based on object. They called it object-oriented programming. And uh, 
it was based on C syntax. So what they call that? They call this C++. It means one feature is added to C, and that's object orientation, which is OOP244 that you're going to learn next semester. So information. One thing I have to explain to you that we are in college now. I'm not going to go through the stuff that I see. I see the name, and I'll tell you the, the title over here, and I'll try to come up with what I have in my brain. And the way we work in this class is, again, as I mentioned, is completely different with other IPCs. So you will see that uh, uh, the topics that I talk about, you're going to go home, and you're going to actually um, uh, read those things, and the next day you're going to come with questions. Okay, um, so uh, the information. Uh, when I when we say information, essentially anything that uh, it's a very difficult task to a, a very difficult thing at this day and age to say what information is. When you go back. Information was essentially any type of data you had about anything, and you wanted to process it, put it in order, and figure out what that data suits you and what it wants to do for you. You had um, spend money on five different items. The information is the amount of money you paid for those five items, and you want to get those information, put them together, and then uh, add them up and see what the result, what, what is the, the amount of cost of the whole thing that you had for this shopping thingy, and that became information. How do we store those information in a computer is a very crazy thing. And I'll explain quickly. I'm not going to go into detail. Probably in um, one of your subjects, they're going to go through it in detail and tell you what they are. I'm not going to go too much in detail. I'm just going to explain to you how it's kept, and then we're going to go through it. Um, uh, we're going to start doing the uh, high-level stuff. First of all, when we are talking about low-level programming language and a high-level programming language, um, as we mentioned, computer is a dumb thing, extremely dumb. Talking to it is very difficult. So if you want to talk in a computer language, it's going to take a long, long, long time those languages that are very close to the language of CPU, they are called low-level languages, languages that you have, have to spend hours of hours to show an A on a screen. Okay? That's it. High-level languages are languages that are very close to our language. Therefore, we tell to the computer, print A, and that print A is going through a process we called compilation, it will be translated to that low-level level language automatically, and the low-level language is fed to the computer. Therefore, it prints A. So essentially, when you say print A, print B, thousands of lines of code are generated and fed to the CPU, so you see an A and a B on a, on a screen. OK? So high-level language, close to the language of the computer. Low, uh, sorry, low-level language, close to the language of the computer. High-level language, close to human beings. Uh, okay? C is a middle-level language, which means you can treat it as low, which means you can be a geek, a nerd, or a hacker, or something. Go and hack the computer the way you want. Or you can treat it as high-level language and write it uh, treat it as uh, regular language and work with it uh, and ask computer to do certain things and it gets compiled to many different things. So that's, a, that's what it, what's the beauty of C language. You can do anything you want with it. When they, want to keep, when they wanted to keep the information inside uh, a computer, first of all, Nothing can happen without a memory. I want you to understand this. When I'm talking about these basic things, they, they, they sound very boring and like, what the heck, of course. But we have to put all these things together to see how they actually built that thing. When I say anything you do needs a memory, think about it for a second. Um, it's a stupid example, but if I'm thirsty and I want to pick up a cup and drink some water, and by the time my hand gets to the water, I forget that I was thirsty. 
I will not drink. You need to store that thought of yours somewhere so you can do something at a later time. If time passes and you don't have memory, essentially means taking information throughout time so you can use later. If you don't have memory, you're in trouble. Are we okay with this? So how do we keep information in the computer? They said, we're gonna create switches. So they have switches in a computer, okay? Which essentially, each switch shows two different positions. So let's say I put a light above my door of my office, and I'm gonna say, if the light is on, it means I'm in the office, you can come in. If the light is off, it means I'm not there. So I ex what, how many pieces of information I, ex I showed to you now? Two, right? A true thing or a false thing? That true thing or false thing could be anything. Door is locked or not. I'm happy or not. <laughs> Okay, the computer is on is or not. Am I, am I thirsty or I'm not? Anything. So that's one. Then they say, that does nothing. <laughs> I need more. So what they have done was this. They said, now that we have this thing and we actually, <coughs> we actually have that single switch, if we put two of those side by side, what's going to happen? So I have one switch and I put the second one beside it. This one can either be true or false. F false, we call it zero. True, we call it one, okay? So if I have two of these, then how many different situations I can cover with this? They can both be off, right? I can have this one off and this one on. I can have this one on and this one off. Now I can have both on. So how many different positions I can show now? Four. It's better. I'm going somewhere. So if I put three of the switches side by side, then what can I do? I'm going to say, I'm going to put a zero beside all these. And I'm going to have another one over here, four of them, and repeat the same pattern. Now how many different positions I can show? Eight. So it's essentially, if I have three switches, I can show two to power three things, correct? Okay. The goal of the computer was to be able to communicate with human beings. So they had to flag these to be able to keep characters with which we communicate. So what they did, they said, let's create a table, put all the alphabet, and assign it to these. OK? So what you see right now over here, so this is now four of them, right? Uh, three of them, right? So what if I have something like this? Let me actually um, open this for a second. text file. So if I have four of them, what's going to happen? I have, I have zero, 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 if I have four of them, right? And then for the rest, it happens something like this. One, two, three, four, and then I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. OK? And then I'm going to go back up. Now in here, what I'm going to have is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 1, 2, 3, 4. And 1, 2, 3, 4. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, okay, I made a mistake. So that's one, that's zero, that's one, 
one, one, one. Then I'm going to go two zeros, two ones. And at the end, I'll go zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And I keep doing that. Oops. I have, and I have four, I have 16 different positions, right? So the 16 different positions that I have is not, yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. One, two. So one, two, three, four. Oh, it should be one, 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 one over here. Yeah. I need to. I need to do it, Anna. I, I am sorry. It's zero. Oh, so if one is. I try to put it on the. Usually, I do it on a board, but zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. And. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is correct down to this point. This one is going to be zero. And this one is going to be one. Let me pause this, not to bore people with this. So those will be the patterns we are putting for 16 numbers. Now, 16 numbers is not enough to tag all the alphabet, OK? So what happens if I put eight of them together? First of all, seven doesn't make sense. How many things I have in the alphabet? I have 20, 26, 26 right? So two, two pounds. So if I have, I have 16 like this. If I have five, I have 32. 32 can cover the 26. But what about lower cases? Then it becomes more, right? So then I have to make it six, so it becomes 64. But what about all the uh, punctuations and things like that, like dashes and hyphens and things like that? For those, I have to add one more. It becomes seven. Seven bits goes up to 128 different positions. But that's not symmetrical. Seven doesn't make sense because with these, they simply could specify what the value of a unit is if we had eight of them. How? They would simply say, I would put, call this, put this one zero, and this one one, and this one two, and this one three, three, and this one four, and five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then because they ran out with digits, they said, let's be creative. A, B, C, D, E, and F. So these, which we call it hexadecimal number, can represent a bit pattern. Every switch is called a bit. So if I put two of these side by side, if I write something like two, um, I don't know, B over here, if I write 2B, I can say 2 is 0010, and I can say B is 1011. Therefore, I can, with two, only two hexadecimal, I can show one thing. And that's 256 different positions. So that's got stuck. That's what we call a byte. A byte is a collection of eight switches together that represents what a character is. So when you think you are actually showing A, B, C, you're actually showing bytes with those bit patterns. You're asking the computer to show the bit pattern. And what the bit patterns are, these are the ASCII tables. So if you actually Google an ASCII table, ASCII table. 
So images, uh, which one is good? Mm, this one is okay, I think. Whoa, there you go. So when you look at it, these are the hexadecimal values that I just mentioned, and these are the and, and these are the uh, all the standard ASCII values that you have. So when you say 32, which essentially means space, which hex is 21. When you say 34, it's double coat. When you say 65, where is 65? Mm, 65, decimal 65, that's capital A. When you say 92, 92 is actually a backslash. When you say 60, when you say 97, that's A. So all the values, patterns that you put side by side, that builds up all the things, okay? So that became the, uh, essentially, the basic unit of your memory. So when you say, I have 64 gigabytes of RAM, you have 64 gigabytes of those 68-bit uh, switches in your memory that they all go on and off. Got it? That's memory. Now, why am I telling you all these things? What I'm telling you is that that switch is not accessible in a computer. You cannot ask the computer to tell you what is the value of bit number 54. It doesn't understand the bit. The smallest thing that computer understands is a byte, a collection of eight bits. We know there are eight bits in a byte. The computer itself doesn't know. The computer thinks, I have one thing that can get 256 different positions. And those 256 different positions are what we call in binary uh, uh, base, a, a base of two. When I say base of two, uh, what is the base of our daily thing? It's 10, right? Because we have 10 fingers. So I go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I don't have a 10. 10 is essentially a 1 and a 0, right? 0 to 9 is my fingers. 10 doesn't exist. There is no digit called 10. Now imagine, yes, that's it. Trust me, it's 10. OK, so <laughs> now. Imagine if we had eight fingers in each hand, what would have happened? Then I had zero, yada, 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 going up to F. When I would say 10, one, zero, it actually meant 16 plus zero, right? And then one, so it essentially, so that, that's what it is. So you have to realize, and if you had only one finger in one, in one hand, then you had a binary system. Okay, you had zero, one, then 10 would have mean, meant a two and a zero, right? A two, right? 10 would have meant, meant a two. 10 in hexadecimal means 16. 10 in our daily life means 10, okay? So computer works on binary system. And it's a very freaky thing. You're gonna find out soon. But it's, the, the good thing is about it is that they created all, and that's, low-level language. So when you are writing a program in assembly language, you are literally dealing with that. That's why I'm saying it's so hard. So in here, I say the character 65 means capital A, right? But in CPU language, you put two of these bytes together, and that means repeat. It doesn't mean A. And the code is, I don't know, 0F3C. So you need to know 0F3C means repeat. Or another two things means add. So it's a very tough language to work with. So that's why they created high level languages. So you do all those stuff, and the compiler translates it to what we call an executable which is essentially those zeros and ones that the compiler understands. So the action of programming for us is to write in English, but in a very limited English. C language has only 13 keywords, and that's it. 
and it works only with that. So we have to narrate ourselves and bring down our vocabulary down to 13. Then we can add up to our vocabularies in a certain way. So we can, we can create, bring, create our own vocabulary. We'll come to it. Uh, we come to it soon. But again, we write in that language. That language gets compiled. The outcome is an executable where you execute, and it runs what you requested. 95% of the time, what you requested is garbage, which means that's, and it's not, it's not you, it's me, anyone, anybody, the first draft of the program they write, if it actually translates automatic properly, and you didn't make any grammar mistakes, we call it syntax errors. Syntax errors it means you didn't write the language properly. You talked incorrectly. The compiler didn't understand how to compile it. If you write it in proper C language, compiler could compile it, your logic is flawed. You run it and you see, oh my god, it's never ending. It keeps doing something. You stop it with lots of difficulty. You ask operating system, I screwed up. Please stop my program. And the, 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 the operating system stops. Then you go back on your program and see, what the heck did I do wrong? And say, ah, there you go. That's the problem. You fix it. Now it doesn't hang, but it doesn't give you the proper answer. So you again come back. You say the calculation was wrong. You do that. You go over there wrong again. Come back over. You do it. And finally, you get the answer. And then you want to submit the answer. And I tell you, your answer is supposed to be on column four and five, but you printed it on column five and six. It's not acceptable. OK? This is what programming is. B exact. One thing that I mentioned, I don't know to you guys or uh, to, to OP244 class, but we'll find out who. And my apologies for my, my cell phone. Please turn off your cell phones, you people. Bad people you are. Nobody knows it's mine. All right. All right. It was actually genuine. They were calling me from UPS, but who cares? Anyway, so did I talk about guns in this class? No? I didn't talk about guns. OK. Everybody's now excited. Guns? <laughs> yeah. OK, guns. If you ever want to handle a firearm, what do they tell you? They take you through extensive training. They tell you lots of stuff that you have to have no question about. For example, you never point a gun towards anybody else, even if the gun is empty. You have to always point it down, things like that. So there are certain rules and regulations you have to follow. And you don't question them. Why don't you question them? Because if you don't, somebody will die. OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because the reason that I tell you guns, because programmers think what we do is a joke. It's not. If you write your programming correctly, you don't follow the standards and the guidelines that you're supposed to do to the program, airplanes crash, trains collide. Nuclear reactors explode. These are all done, but what we do, it's not a joke. And not only that, if you do a simple miscalculation by 0 0.0001, it's the difference between a company going bankrupt because by mistake it's losing money and it doesn't know it, or has some problem in its accounting calculations, it's going to be sued by IRS or CRA or whatever it is. So it is extremely important to follow the rules. And I'll tell you why. You are starting as programmers. So when you are going to get hired, the very first thing you're going to do is going to be a programmer. A programmer is like a foot soldier. You have to listen to your commander no matter what, and then ask questions. So if I'm telling you, do this and that and print this, you don't understand why. First, you do it. Then you ask why, OK? So following the rules and being exact in your programming is extremely important. Please appreciate this. And this is when I'm telling it in RPC 144, I'm so happy. I hope that you're going to come with me to OP345. And you can keep this attitude with you to be exact 
and follow instructions until you become a system analyst. And when you become a system analyst, you're going to report to a director. So all the programmers will listen to you. You listen to a director. And, and when you become a director, then you're the person who makes up decisions to what's going to happen. But that's 15 years from now, 18 counting your graduation. <laughs> OK, so something like that. So what I'm saying is that please be exact in following the instructions. Um, many of you did workshop zero. I thank you. But you didn't follow the instructions. When I ask you that in your readme file, you have to have the course at the top, then your student number, then your name, you added me as a collaborator. And I went in there, and I see there is nothing there where it's supposed to be. You cannot skip anything. There are no shortcuts. Please follow the instructions exactly. And believe me, you're going to be the happiest, most successful programmer ever. So now we know what uh, informations are, and we know what compilers are. We're going to start doing some C programming. So we're going to start. And again, I don't want to, I used to actually drag this for two, two, two sessions. I started from the beginning, go through all the little details. I just want to tell you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And then we'll come out, and we're going to actually start doing the thing. Now, questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right. You want to take a five minutes break? And then we're going to continue. Please remind me to resume recording. So to, to uh, join the team, the best way is to actually go to your IPC144 uh, subject on Blackboard. So log into Seneca. Go to uh, IPC144. Where is IPC 144? That's the one. Then in IPC 144, you can go to Faculty Information Office and Help and click on Online Office and Help. That brings you directly to the, to the Teams. And if you don't have access to it, you can literally say, I want to join, and it joins you. So just, cl just click on this, and it brings you. It, 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 you, did, and, and then you join? Oh, yeah, beautiful. So, I, I, so probably you're, you're now a member. <laughs> so that's OK. Uh, but I will, ma I, will manually, I will manually add everyone. I just want to make sure that a week has passed because students register and go off the things because I, I'm scary people. <laughs> so yeah, anyways. OK, so. Um, we passed the five minutes threshold, right? Or let's wait for two more minutes. <laughs> All right, so how do we go about coding in C language? The very first thing that we need to know, uh, first of all, I'm going to post uh, uh, on, on Microsoft Teams an announcement. I'm going to give you a, um, a playlist of how to start working with Xcode so those people with Apple, if you want to work with Xcode, that's what you want to do. Follow those instructions how to do it. Now I'm going to go with Visual Studio, uh, but you need to know Visual Studio to do your tests and stuff because everything that is done at your tests are done using Visual Studio and things like that, and so and uh, the, co the computers in the lab. So be aware of that. So uh, how do we go about programming in uh, in uh, uh, Windows environment. I may bring a Mac later on in a lab and, and show, demonstrate to you. But, uh, you have to forgive me when you look at that Mac. It has lots of stickers on the back that doesn't correspond to my age. It's my daughter's. So anyway, so, so with Visual Studio, we, uh, when you open Visual Studio, such a thing comes up. And if you follow the instructions of Workshop Zero and you've, you've, you have installed C++ uh, compiler, don't be confused, C++ is a superset of C, which means every C++ compiler can compile a C compiler. It's a C program. But a C program cannot compile a C++ because C++ is one stage higher. OK? The, that's why you put C++ and it still works. So you create a new project. 
And then you're going to uh, select an empty project uh, from scratch, C++ for Windows, provide no starting files. That's what we're going to select. And if you do it, it's going to put it in recent, so you can keep selecting that one. Then you select that one, and it create. And I'm going to do this a few times at the beginning of the class um, until we get used to it, and then I'm not going to do it anymore. And it, at any moment, if you think I'm going too fast or something doesn't make sense, please let me know. And then you create an empty project. You click on Next. Then select the location in which you want the project to be. So it essentially creates a directory for you. I'm going to go to IPC144. And as I mentioned you, you do everything in GitHub. Did we talk about GitHub in this class? Did we talk about GitHub? Did we cover GitHub, tell you what GitHub is? Did I? OK. So this IPC144 NBB only that you see is a clone of the repository we have on GitHub. And I do everything in here. Therefore, when I'm done, I commit and push it. Everything goes on GitHub, and therefore, you have quite quick access to it. You should do your work in your IPC144 works repository that you did in Workshop 0. So you do all your work for your IPC work in that directory. You commit and add and push, and you're done. So as you see, I'm creating something new. I'm going into Notes. And in notes, I'm going to say select folder. So in the notes directory, it's going to folder. It's going to create a folder for me that's going to represent the work we're going to do today. OK? So uh, because of that, I always use a specific type of pattern for the project name. You're going to put over here WS1 lab, something like that. WS1 DIY, whatever we, the name of the workshop is WS1 is workshop one. OK? So you. Anyways, come up with some kind of a name, some kind of an organization and standard of your own, and don't be sloppy. Don't put everything in a root of your folder. Create subdirectories, subfolders, and be organized so you don't lose your stuff. Okay? So in here, as you see, I'm going to call it 01. That means it's the first one. Dash, it's the date is January 11th. So I'll put January 11th. And that's going to be the name of the project. So when you see in the notes, that's the notes for today. OK? And you're going to see the recordings on YouTube. Then you're going to see it matches with this one. So if you are watching the YouTube video to uh, kind of go through what, what I talked about, you can come over here and see what are the codes that related to that thing. Make sure you always check the place, solution, and project in the same directory. What is the difference between a solution and a project? A solution is a set of projects. You can have 20 projects in a solution. For example, you are writing a, an e-commerce system for a, for, a, for a shop. You call it e-com. That's the name of your solution. Then in your e-com, you can have POS for point of sale. You can have uh, um, INV for inventory. You can have uh, web for the shopping cart. So you have three different projects inside the e-commerce project that you have. So we don't have that. We are writing a loop to print five numbers. Because of that, we don't need to have several projects in a solution. Our solution and project is the same, and we are practicing in it. Therefore, always select the dash over here, place solution and project in the same directory. So then you click on Create, and that's going to create the basic thing you need for your uh, uh, project. What you see over here that says 01 Jan 11, that's actually on the hard drive. So if I actually look at the hard drive or your repository, you will see in that repository, I have 01 Jan 11. OK? But if you go over here, that's it. There are no folders. So all the folders that you see in here where you put the stuff in, they are just filters. They are not fo folders. These are the things that Visual Studio organizes your code. They are all in the same directory. So when you look at the directory, you're going to have five different files over there. But you're going to see three of them are in source files, and two of them are in header file. And you have your documentations and your resources. But when you look at Jans 11, everything is in one thing. There are no directories over there. You can be organized over here, too. Okay. Then I want to start coding. So I need a source, source code. So I go to source files, right click over here. I'm going to go add new item. 
and you go to code, you select CPP. It is CPP, but it's not. So in here, you, all you need to do to tell to the compiler, hey, it's not C++, you call it, for example, PRG.C. When I call it C, compiler knows it is supposed to deal with this as a C code, not a C++ code. And you click Add, and it creates it for you. Okay? And it's empty. If you do the same thing on Xcode, if you have... Um, and I'll, I'll put it up for you. Uh, I think I had uh, something, um, and I'm going to put that. If when you do the project thinking on Xcode, Xcode actually writes a, <laughs> a sample hello world for you to over there to run. Uh, we're going to go through that later, but this is for now Visual Studio. So now that we are at this stage, we are going to... Uh, um, uh, let's give me a second over here. So this is a blank file in which I can write my C code, okay? This is a blank file in which I can write my C code. So, <clears throat> what is the difference between this and just open something like Notepad or what is the standard text editor on Mac? What is the name of the, do you have one? Something like, is there anything on Mac that is a just plain text editor? Nothing? <laughs> notepad? There you go. So, Notepad, if you have, like, working something with a Notepad, what is the difference between this one? The difference between this and Notepad is that with Notepad, it's like you're going to, I don't know, never go to, but if, let's say, you're going to McDonald's and you say, I want a burger, and I want a fries, and I want the thing. So you, you do things yourself, which means you have to write the code yourself. You have to make sure everything is good. And then you have to take get out of Notepad, which means you ordered your burger. Now you have to go to fries, which means you have to go with it and start compiling the code manually. So you have to bring up the compiler of, uh, of the system and say, compiler, compiler, compile the code that I have. So it translates it into... Uh, binary, executable. Then you have to get your drink, which means now you have to go and execute that thing manually. But this one is like saying, I want combo number one. <laughs> Everything comes with it. It has a text editor. It, ha it knows where the compiler is. It knows how to compile it. It knows how to execute it. It helps you learn to program without having to go through the fuss of dealing with the compiler manually. That's why they call it an Integrated Development Environment. Now, it not only C, you can do C Sharp with it, you can do Java with it, you can do JavaScript, you can do, like many compilers comes with inter integrated de development environments. Same thing as Xcode. When you look at Xcode, you C, C++, Objective-C, you can have def many different types of languages you can work with. But anyways, so <clears throat> how do we write? Uh, a C program. A C program is written uh, like this. So the very first thing you need to do, uh, as I mentioned, C language is a middle level language, which means it does not, it has only 13 keywords in it. The C language doesn't even know how to print something on a screen. They didn't want to make it big, so they put those things away. Then they packaged all those stuff and brought it separately. So first you have to tell to C language, I want those packages to be included in my compilation. So what you do, you talk to the compiler. Talking to the compiler, anything that starts with a hashtag, it means it's not C language. You are talking to the compiler of C language, telling to the compiler to do something before it wants to translate your code to machine language. And as you see, that's the integrated development environment. It actually helps you to continue and actually write the thing. So if when I say over here, I, it knows it could be if, if, def, yada, yada, and include. Forget about all those things. Include is what, is it, what we are interested in. So I'm going to say include. So I'm including. What am I including? Standard input output header file which essentially means I am asking the compiler to bring all the input output stuff so I can read from the keyboard and I can print on a screen. That's all. If you don't do that, C doesn't know how to do it. People think that's a 
weakness of C language, but that's power. When you want to go camping, it's better to only get with you what you need, not everything in your house. Okay? So that's what it is. You only select what you want to do with your code. You don't bring the whole package with you. Therefore, the code is much lighter, the executable is smaller, and the language is faster, quicker, and neater. Okay? What is a programming language? What, sorry, what is a program, a computer program? Can anybody tell me what is a computer program? Seriously? If it, like you've watched oh, movies, people are doing something. I'm writing a program to do this. Anybody knows what is a computer program? My lady, you're my hero. Go ahead. Set of instructions that performs a specific task. Thank you. Set of instructions that perform specific tasks. You can come and teach instead of me too. But anyways, uh, what is a recipe for cooking? Can anybody tell me? Anything. Set of instructions. Set of, set of instructions to do something so you have something at the end, like a cake or a sandwich or... I don't know, butter chicken or whatever you like, right? So you have to go through the recipe and do stuff, okay? They tell you first you have to boil the water, then you have to add the, like you're doing pasta, that's the easiest thing in the world. You have to boil the water, add a bit of salt if you want to, put the pasta, let it become al dente, and then you can take it out, get the sauce, put it, add it, and you have a pasta to eat. You cannot first add salt to the dry pasta and then boil the water and then dip the sauce and then put, you can't do that. There are a series of instructions. First you have to do this, second, third. So things has to be in sequence, okay? So when I tell you want to come to the store, if, if, you, if you are a computer and I, got, and I tell you to come to class, you're going to just stand looking at me. You don't understand. I have to tell you, get close to the door. Take your hand to the handle. Twist the handle. Push the door. Come forward, let it go, the door's got to get closed, you can come in. I cannot tell you, come in, open the door, twist the handle. Everything has to be in sequence. Do we understand this? Okay, that's what programming language is. We need to do stuff in sequence. Number two. From my body, you know I love cooking. So I'm going to... I, I'm going to actually have lots of metaphors coming out of that. <laughs> so, 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 so. When you are making different type of pasta, okay? I live in an Italian neighborhood, so pasta is whatever I see every day. So when you want to do pasta, usually making the pasta itself is standard. And then different sauces you add to it. So boiling the water, after adding whatever you are, you're adding, to it. So you do it and you wait to be al dente and then the next one. So usually when they want to tell you to make chicken alfredo or make to meatball pasta, they, they, when they are telling you, first they tell you prepare your pasta, then add the alfredo sauce and cooked chicken. And the other one says prepare your pasta, add the meatballs and a, and a tomato sauce and stuff. So what happens is that the action of making the pasta become something standard. I don't have to go through the details for it. I can write preparing a pasta separately and tell you go to page 34, see how the pasta is made, bring that one and then add this and this and this. So I don't have to repeat the same recipe over and over and over. Do we understand this? That's the basic of C language. C language works with functions, which are essentially sub recipes. Every single thing that you want to do, you package it in functions. So you don't have to repeat what you say over and over and over and over. Okay? And the standard thing is like that. But when you have several different recipes that make one food, you need to know which one is first, correct? You always start from one place. And that place brings there all the sub-recipes, correct? That's why we have one special function in C language that has its own name that cannot change and you have to live with it all the time. And that's where everything begins, okay? 
we call that function main. So remember, main function, the name cannot change. When compiler is compiling, it knows everything starts with main. Then after that, you can do whatever you want to do. Okay? So main is where everything begins. Do we understand that? Okay. For those people who, <coughs> like, just to tell you what a function is, functions have different types of, like, I don't want to go into math because as soon as I say math, everybody runs to the door. Uh, <laughs> I studied applied math when I was a kid. So, so I love it, but hey, people don't like it, and I go with that. I have to teach the students, so I have to go with the flow. So functions have uh, three different things. What, some of the functions, uh, they just, some of the functions, they just do things, and they're done. They do their stuff and they're done. It's like those uh, motion sensors that you have when you walk in front and poof, the light comes up. Oh, thank you. And then you pass, the light goes off, right? It just works at itself. You don't give it something, anything. You don't get anything from it. All you need to do is to say, could you please turn on the, oh, thank you, the light is on, and you pass through. So you don't, you don't do anything other than calling them. We, then we have functions. Then we have functions that you have to actually give it different things and then call them. Like when you have your remote control of it for a TV, you have to select the channels and then go to different channels. So you have to tell which channel to go to and then change the channel. So that's the second type of a thing. Or, or the third one is like a meat grinder. You put the meat from one side, it gets the meat, grinds it, and you get the ground meat from the other side. That's another function. You give it something, you turn on the machine, it passes through and gives you a result. We start from basics, okay? We start from places that we, uh, uh, we don't deal with any functions that returning anything. But uh, sadly, I can't, uh, the main function of C language is not like that. The main function of C language doesn't receive anything, but it has to return something. Why? Because the main function of C language is called by operating system. And after it's done, it always asks the program, how did it go? And your program must tell it if it went good or not. Everything was good, nothing happened, or something went wrong. Anyways, so the main function of C language syntax is as follows. Int means an integer. Who knows what's an integer? So that's it, five things, one, two, three, and four, five, and that's it. So integer is one, two, three, four. Now, what is integer? Go ahead. A number that doesn't have a fraction? Okay. Doesn't have fractions, essentially integral number, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't have any partial numbers. That's what an integer is. So I'm actually telling to the operating system, that this thing is going to give me an integer after it's done. The name is men. main. It doesn't receive anything. And this is what it's going to do. So between that open bracket and close curly bracket, I am telling what main is supposed to do. That's the syntax of all functions in C language. When you are writing them, not when you are calling them. When you are building them. Okay? All right. Now, inside and at the end of it, I have to send something out to the operating system, tell the operating system everything's good. We are doing kindergarten stuff, so we're not going to tell anything else. Almost to the end of OP244, you always tell to the operating system everything went well. Okay? So, and how do you do that? Well, is only in this stage, no news is good news. So when you say return zero, it means nothing happened, nothing special happened. You can return anything, yes, we can return 234. Operating system is not going to do anything, but it just knows that something went, something happened and, it, and the code for it was 234. 234 doesn't mean anything, by the way. Okay, you have to come up with that. So it's, there is no must. But just accept this, that this is a blank main function that you have to write. Integer main and it returns a zero. 
So if I compile and compile this program, what's going to happen? Build the same thing as a compile. So when you compile, if I can actually right click over here and go compile. You see that? I can right click on my, on my code and I can click on compile. Or I can press control F7. It's an integrated de development environment. It makes things easy. I can do control and press F7. I cannot see F7 here. Whoa. Uh, five, six, seven. I can do this, and it compiles. And what does it say? Build started project. Yada 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 yada. PRG.C. In computer science, no news is good news. So when you do something and nothing comes back, you should go yay! It's always like that. Okay. If it tells you something, it means something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So no news is good news. So that's what it does and it goes over there. So now it compiled this one, but it only translated that to the thing. It didn't make the executable yet. To make the executable, you should build it. That's what they call it. So now I'm going to actually right click on the solution and I'm going to say build solution. So building solution actually compiles and creates the executable for me. So now I have 0, 01 January 11, my project.exe, which means I can execute it. So let's execute it. Let's execute it. So I'll go to documents. I'll go to IPC 144. I'll go to IPC 144 only. I go to notes. I go to January 11. And that's the place that I'm in, x64, that's the place that I have the results of the compilation. And down there I have a debug, and down there I have an executable. Do I need to know where it is? No, I can just ask the IDE to run it for me. But if I want to run it manually, I can too, there is no problem. So I can actually double click on this, and it actually runs it, see? It actually ran it, it was on this window, came up and went down. Let me go to the other one and show you what happens. So to run it, I can go build and I can say uh, run. You see that? Or control F5. That executes and runs the program and that's the outcome of my program. What did my program do? Nothing. Why? Because I didn't do anything. Computer is dumb. I created a program. In that program, I asked for nothing. I compiled it, I ran it, it ran beautifully. It did nothing as I expected. So the first program written with no bugs and everything's as I expected, okay? Now, in that standard input output header file of yours, there is a function whose job is to print things on a screen. It's called print formatted, print formatted. And it's called, so, so if you call it, you have to say, to actually call that function, main is called by the operating system. Who do I call? Printf. So I'm going to go in my main and I'm going to say printf. And in here, I'll put something for it to print. To put something in printf to print, you have to put it in, in double quotes, as you say, hello, everyone. Okay, it's exactly that. Anything you want printf to say, you put it in double quotes. So now in here, I'm going to say, hello, IPC144, and then I want to go to new line. Okay? So, ah, let's actually do it like this. That's good enough. Hello, IPC144. And now, when I compile and run this code, main is going to be called by the, by the operating system. Your main is going to call printf. And printf is going to get this information and print it on a screen. So when I run this program, I will get over here, hello, IPC144. And that's literally the first C program I have written. OK? All right. Now, how to write my own functions? If I want to say hello IPC144 program, I want that function to be called hello. 
So whenever I say hello, it does hello IPC144. How do I do it? Exactly like main. So what do I do? I go on top of main, but this time <clears throat> I don't want it to return anything. I just want to print a hello. What is nothing in English, in Shakespearean English? When you want to say nothing, what do you say? Void. Void is nothingness, right? Void means nothing. Okay, so in here, actually in that main, I have to put a void, which means I'm not receiving anything in here. It's a good idea to do that. And then in here, I'm going to say void, hello, void, which means I'm not giving it anything. I'm not asking for anything. All I want it to do is to say printf. So the hello function of mine is going to do printf. So what do I do now? I go in my main, and all I need to do say to call it, I say hello. Done. So when the program runs, so when the program runs, and this is one of the beauties of IDEs, you can actually demonstrate execution with it. So I'm going to put this one at right side and put this one at left side. At right side, you see how the program is running. At left side, you see the output. I just pressed F10. F10 means go one line at a time. F11 means go inside the function. So if I press F10 here, take a look. I'm going to press F10. I'm going to click over here. I'm going to press F10. You see it comes on hello. If I press F10 again, it's going to run the whole thing as one command. So poof, you're going to see hello IPC144. And then at the end, return, and the program ends. Finished. Done. OK? Or I can press F10. Or I can press F10 one more time to compile and run. And when I get to hello, I press F11, which means Go inside hello. So it's going to go inside hello, and now it's going to show printf is happening, and then it comes back in main and finishes. That's uh, the essence of C language. C language is a language of functions. So if I wanted to say hello IPC144, and then I wanted to introduce myself, so what I do, I'm going to write over here, I'm going to say, introduce. And I'm going to introduce myself, write the function over here for introduction. I'm going to say void, introduce, void, and in here I'm going to say printf, my name is Fardad Soleiman. And you will see that I'm going to have the first bug of my, my programming right away. <laughs> Why does it give me an error over here? Expect this. Oh, I. Semicolon. Okay. All right. So now my question is what is the output of this program? We expect that it says hello IPC 144. And because I'm saying hello over here, then I'm going to say introduce, right? And in the introduce, I'm saying my name is Fardat Solimandli, correct? So the second thing is being called, right? Are we okay with this? Am I going too fast? Is it not understandable down to this point? Are we all good? 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 We are okay? All right? Yes? Void, it means you give it nothing. You get it. Get nothing from it. See, each function is a machine that receives something, does something with it, and returns the outcome. This receiving and returning happenings, happens between functions, not outside world. So printing something is not returning anything. It's printing on a screen. Returning, it means your introduce returns something to main. Your hello, and it doesn't. 
you don't give anything to hello, you don't get anything from hello. Therefore, hello is not receiving or returning anything to other functions. Other functions talk with each other. You can give it something, you can get something from it in the functions. They do their own things. They can actually print something on a screen, but that has nothing to do with other functions. As I mentioned, you walk in a corridor, the light comes on. You didn't do anything. You just told the light by your movement, go on. So the function on is called. You didn't give it anything. It's not giving you anything. It does what it does, which is turning the light on. Okay? It's the same thing over here. This hello over here is not giving anything to main. It's not receiving anything to, from main. The introduce over here doesn't receive anything from main, doesn't return anything to main. All the main is doing says, hello, go. Then after that goes, introduce, go. And they do their thing. That's all. Clear? Yes, sir. What if we use only that one? Yeah. Then your okay. Okay, 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 okay. What does this program do? And you are not seeing the functions. What do you expect this program will do? Answer the question. What does? Of course, it does something. What does the name of the function says? So first, it's going to say hello. After that, what it's going to do? So without looking at the function, you know it's going to say hello, and it's going to say introduce. I am giving you examples of very simple functions. I understand. OK? That's perfectly good. But the thing is that let's say the function was return credit store score, which means this function has to get connected to internet, go to the, the what is that, Equifax, send your SIM number to Equifax, get your credit, credit score, and return it to me. And that's 50,000 lines of code. What would be the difference? Call it in main or put it in a function separately? Makes your code organized. It is extremely important not to think that my function is too small. Make your program readable. So when somebody looks at your program looking, and don't call the functions A and B. Call the function something meaningful. When somebody looks at your function, they can guess what happens inside. Do they care? How do it, does it happen? No. When you are turning the light on, do you care what happens inside the light bulb? No. You want light. Now, what if I told you instead of turning the light on, you have to actually build the light bulb and do that thing with the register? You don't want to do that, right? So that's a beautiful question. Thank you. I love that question. So don't ever, don't ever try to bring the hearts of a recipe inside the main recipes. Just make the main recipe very confusing. OK? And that's that. So, the first bug that I wanted to mention over here is this. So if I actually run this program, I'm going to press F10. So it goes to hello. Then I'm going to press F11. And I'm not bringing this from the air. If you look, go to debug, debug tells you step into is F11, step over is F10. OK? And step out is Chef 11. So if you have a function that does 1,000 lines of code, you just went to it and say, oh, I know it works properly. I don't want to walk through this. I want to get out. You go Shift 11, it executes the whole thing and jumps out. OK? So it actually shows you all those things. So I'm going to say over here now F11 to go inside. And then it's going to print. So it prints that one. Then it comes out. Now it wants to introduce myself, goes to introduce. And does, oh, oh, first of all, name is Nam. <laughs> That's a, a typo. Secondly, I want it to be in the next line. The computer is that dumb. It doesn't think that. You have to tell it to go to new line. It doesn't know that it has to. Or maybe you didn't want to go to new line. OK? So you have to mention that. First of all, let's fix this. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to make this one name, OK? And in here, new line is a special character. It's one of those things that they had to make the bits eight. Remember I told you there are so many things, curly brackets, hashtags, uh, I don't know, double quotes. One of those things is new line. 
new line is actually a character like ABC. When you print it, you are telling to the uh, computer to go to the next line. And that's all those special characters that they don't print something, but they do something on a screen, they start with a backslash. Okay, so backslash N means new line. So now I can write over here backslash N, it means hello IPC144 NBB. And then in here it's going to say my name is Vardat Salimanlu, and it's going to go backslash N. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to make that your first workshop. So your first workshop is going to be create this function that does this, so you'll see exactly what it is, and I'm going to ask you to put it in different functions. Very simple program, you should be able to do it in, a, uh, um, in 30 minutes. I'll post the workshop, you'll see it. I just want you to get a hold of your Xcode or your uh, Visual Studio, and I'm going to put the playlist for Xcode for people who have Macs so that you can actually do it using that. Okay, so then after this, now if I actually run the program, it comes to hello, it prints like that, and as you see now, the cursor goes to the next line. You see that? It didn't stand up there. It comes to the next line, and then it comes to the next one, and now it's going to introduce itself. Okay? Are we okay with this? All right. So, again, if you go to, uh, what I want you to do is to focus on these. You can go through the, because it's at the end of the class. Uh, first, oh, and I'm going to show you this. Let me show you something. So I'm going to stop this. So that's the first program that I have written, right? I'm going to save everything, get out of Visual Studio, come down over here, and now I am going to go to the directory of IPC144, go to IPC144 MBB only, and I'm going to right click. And I'm going to go and show more options. If you have Windows 10, there is no show more options. I don't know what Microsoft did. Anyways, I have to go show more options over here. And then three years later, show more options is going to come up. Then you're going to go to Tortoise Git Commit. That brings you up this one. OK? All the things that are needed to be added are here. It doesn't add any more garbage. Why? Because I asked you in workshop zero to create a file called .git ignore. In that .git ignore, I am telling to git what files are important and what you should ignore. So you should never worry about garbage is going to go anywhere. If you have the proper git ignore that I told you to put over there, you don't need to. All you need to do is to click on all. That will add them all. And I'm going to say over here, January 10th, intro to functions. And I'm going to say commit and push. You can have over here only commit and then push manually. But because after, after each commit, I wanted to go to get anyway, I'm going to go over here to commit and push. And it's going to do like this and say successfully done. I'm going to close everything. Now if I actually go to the organization, and go to the IPC 144B only, you will see that in notes you have January entry to uh, functions. In there you have January 11, and if you click, you're going to see prg.cppc is there, and you click, you'll see the code is there. That's why I said you don't need your computers. They're just distraction. Okay? So all these things are here. All right? And that's how everything's going to go up. Are we okay down to this point? Questions? <laughs> Suggestions? <laughs> say it, say it, say no question. Okay, I'm joking. That's okay. <laughs> Are, yes, you have a question? Yes, what's up? In the main, we have written void, so what happens if we don't write return here? <sighs> Compiler does certain things by default. First of all, it depends when did you do that. If you did it 20 years ago, it would have returned zero. Now they are making compilers more strict, not to have unknown boo-boos. Therefore, if you don't like write it, 
it's possible that it's going to give you an error telling you, hey, this function of yours is you are telling in the definition that it's supposed to return an integer, but you don't have any return statements. What am I supposed to do? It depends on the compiler. 90% it's going to give you an error and stop you. And if it doesn't, that's the worst thing. Never leave anything to default because defaults change. Your program behavior will change in tomorrow, and that's shooting yourself in the foot. So, yeah, that was the answer for it, hopefully. It, it was. So, are we okay down to this point? All right, next time you're coming to lab, you're going to see the workshops coming up. You're going to see that uh, quiz zero is going to come up, that you have to get 100% out of it. And we'll see what we're going to do. Any questions, ping me on, on, uh, on uh, Teams, okay? You know how to contact me on Teams. Yes. Did you release the quiz number zero? No, no, no. no not yet. Uh, you're going to get announcement in Teams. So first I'm going to add everybody to Teams, then I'm going to have an announcement on Teams and an announcement on Blackboard. You're going to receive an email, Quiz Zero is released, so you're not going to be surprised. Trust me. Yes? No, this is something more of a personal question. Personal question? Yeah. After. Anyone else? Question? Suggestion? Yes, ma'am. Um, for Workshop Zero... Mm -hmm. I haven't um, done anything yet. Oh, well, that workshop zero. Yeah, yeah. I thought you said quiz zero. Yes. No, no. Like, um, at this part in like the tutorial doesn't work on here. See me online. Huh? I'll take over it and I'll t and I'll show you. I would say you're it's a matrix on part. Teams? Yes. Okay. Okay. Download Teams. See me online. I'll take care of it. I'll fix it. I already done it for a few people. So, uh, any other question? The reason that I didn't help you right now, dear, because I have a class in five minutes, I have to run to the next one. But uh, if you're available at uh, 125, my class ends. You can see my schedule, come to the class, I'll take care of it for you here. Uh, any other question? I'll come to you in a second. Let me just pack my stuff so the next prof doesn't get angry when I get here. <laughs>